Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. It's good to see each of you. Before we begin, I simply want to uh, say hello to those of you who are visiting with us. Uh, We have um, red welcome bags in the back. They contain information about both membership at All Saints and also about all the different uh, ministries going on at All Saints and how you can be involved in them. And at All Saints, we like to put anything we talk about into action And today we bring before you a very, very important program ministry project at All Saints, um, our foster care project. Um, There are many ways that you can participate in helping marginalized and victimized youth uh, become successful adults. Uh, We have many members of the uh, Foster Care Project here. Would you raise your hands if you're a member of Foster Care Project so you can ask these people any questions you have? And then there's a table on the lawn where you can go and sign up to uh, really make a difference in the lives of of children and kids and uh, teenagers, young adults who are living lives that are at risk. So I want to proceed. You ready? Here we go. I am delighted and thrilled and excited and energized to have my sister, Connie Rice, here to speak with us today. She is a fierce, uncompromising, nonviolent warrior, open up a can of pass on people <laughs> against everything that is wrong in society and everything that demeans humanity. All Connie would have to do is call me and say, meet me at the corner of whatever and whatever, and I would show up because I would know that she was up to some good. She has received more than 50 major awards for her leadership and unorthodox approaches to challenging brutality and reversing the raw deal for kids struggling to survive in the thin soil of poverty. She's a graduate of Harvard, Radcliffe Colleges, and New York University School of Law. At her, and her, at her organization, Advancement Project, she continues her crusade for basic rights with her urban peace team after the 2007 release of their seminal report on gang violence in Los Angeles called A Call to Action. Connie's race for excellence began at home. Her father broke racial barriers at a U.S. Air Force major, and her mother, a teacher, imbued a passion for learning and culture into Connie and her brothers Phil and Norman, a zeal equal parts vigor and pride. She was raised to look up to women leaders of history, Queen Elizabeth I and Frank, Representative Barbara Jordan. Her father's career took them to 17 different homes during her childhood, including periods in England and Japan. But these heroines stayed with her as constant reminders of the high potential of her future. After her college at Harvard and law school at NYU, she spent summers working on high-profile death penalty litigation for the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. She began the work that would win her national acclaim for its attention to civil rights. Now, over her, the course of her career here in Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles gang members have dubbed her the Lady Lawyer. She has had become a wonderful, pioneering partner with them and has taken on the notoriously racist and sexist LAPD transit system that tried to ignore its poorest users and a public school system that Connie and her cohorts deemed inadequate. A legend in Los Angeles based on those achievements alone, she is best known for the report she co-wrote that has revolutionized the city's law enforcement policies and outreach to gangs. She now has a book out, which I have on Kindle and have begun reading and can enthusiastically recommend it. Power Concedes Nothing, One Woman's Quest for Social Justice in America, From the Courtroom to the Kill Zones. She is here to talk about her life, to reflect with us on the killings of unarmed African-American youth on our streets, to tell us about her life and give us 
a challenge because Connie doesn't go anywhere without giving people a challenge. Will you please warmly welcome my sister, Connie Rice. We're arguing about who's the best. He's the best. Give him a hand. <laughs> oh, Reverend Bacon, if we ever got together, they'd have to, they'd have to arrest us. Um, because he's such a force of nature, and I've been accused of similar uh, sins. And um, we're both a pain in everybody's you-know-what. And um, it's like life is short. And it is such a gift. It is beyond miraculous. And while we're here, I figure I owe such a huge debt that I've got to work every day double time <laughs> to pay it back. Um, I am the great-granddaughter of slaves and slave owners. And um, I claim all of my ancestors. I, As painful as it is, I can't imagine what... I could have been without the slavers. Now, this is the only place on the planet where I could have been created and where my family could have been created. And that strange history allows me to embrace all kinds of contradictory stuff. So I, I wrote this book, Power Concedes Nothing, because I realized that while we were winning our cases, Marvelous successes. People give us awards and plaques. I don't want another plaque. Please don't give me one. He could wallpaper the Pentagon. People give me plaques rather than actually change the injustices I'm fighting against because it's, it's easier. Um, and so, and it's not about me. While we were winning our cases, our clients were losing their lives. My career is set. I crested the success of my family, all the pioneers that went before us, the suffragists, the abolitionists, the Underground Railroad operators, our marvelous multiracial history of striving for freedom freed me. And I have, I've, I've arrived. I'm free. I wrote this book because my clients are not because all around us are people who aren't going to make it. And the day that I realized that there were nine-year-olds who got up and threw up every morning at the thought of having to walk to school because they were afraid that the gang would stop them and ask them, where are you from? If you were stopped by a carload of youths and asked that question, Every child in South L.A. and East L.A. knows that it means you could be dead in the next second. Because if you give the wrong answer, the kids with, in the cars with the guns will kill you on the spot. Twenty years ago, in the crack wars, in my neighborhood, people... Altadena. People walk their dogs at night, and, and the neighbors actually thought we had a gang problem when they saw some graffiti on the top of a storm drain. And it was in pink ink, and it had hearts over the eyes. <laughs> there was proper punctuation, proper spelling. <laughs> and it said, get high with curly cues. High was properly spelled. And it had an explanation point with hearts on top. I said, ladies and gentlemen, if it's pink ink with hearts and proper spelling, it's not a gang. <laughs> I said, if you want to see a gang, I can take you down to 108th and Grape Street. I can take you to El Sereno. I, 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 I can show you plenty of gangs. But believe me, they're not on Poppy Fields Drive in El Dadina. We live proximate to that. We live with children in our own backyard. We have child soldiers in our own backyard and we don't want to face it. And I wrote this book after a particularly frustrating, my, my sin, Reverend, I've got many of them, but my main sin is impatience. I, 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 you know, I understand it's a sin and I claim it and I try to work on it, but uh, I went to lunch with a reporter 
I do make time for the press because that's one of the things that gives me a little bit of power. I have to hijack other people's power, institutions' power, the police power, uh, in order to get things done because I don't have any power. I don't have a congregation. I don't have membership. I've basically got a big mouth and I'm pretty fearless and I will take you to court. So <laughs> that's about all I've got. I, I, you know, I don't have any money. My law partner has the money. I don't have any money. You know, I, I, so so I've got to, I have to kind of do jiu-jitsu and I have to kind of hijack institutional power, individual politicians power. I will borrow a church's power when I think of power and action. I think of all saints. There are ways, you don't have to have the power yourself. But I wrote this book when a journalist whom I, who took me to lunch, and it was just as the LA Times was disintegrating and we, were doing, we weren't doing news anymore, we were doing infotainment. And I was beginning to get concerned because all of the great journalists were leaving. And, and so I went to lunch with this woman and, and I thought I was going to help orient her and maybe get her to replace one of the great journalists who had left. And she, she sat down and she says, Oh, Connie, tell me about Condi. I said, my cousin? She said, oh, yes, yes. I want to know, how are, how are you two are so different? I said, I said, she said, oh, and I want to know, are you married? I said, are you proposing? I said, what? what, what? <laughs> I started talking about the kid I had left in a hospital that morning. She wanted to know whether I was dating. I said, if I don't care whether I'm dating, why do you care? <laughs> she said, she said, I said, I need you to understand that while we've come a long way, we've got a whole lot more to go. And I need you to, t I need you to understand why we're fighting Prop 21 and why we're fighting. I said, I need you to focus on this juvenile justice stuff. I need you to focus on this mass incarceration. She says, she says, oh, you know, all that poverty stuff. You know, Connie, poverty is just so boring. I said, if you were poor, I don't think you'd find anything boring about it. I said, my clients wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I know because I had to get up when I did the bus case, I had to ride with my clients, and I decided you can't represent people unless you understand what they face, and I am exactly what I look like, an overprivileged African-American empress. I am exactly what I look like. <laughs> I, I am impossible, and Condoleezza is too. We were raised to be impossible, very uppity women. Uppity doesn't even cover us, okay? <laughs> So I don't pretend, I'm not pretending to be something I'm not. I, am ex I claim what I am, all right, of, of, of warts and all, okay? Therefore, I know nothing about poverty, all right? But when I represent the poor, I have to understand what the other is. So I got up before, I went down and stayed with Maria Guajardo, one of our named plaintiffs, and I, I, I stayed in her tiny little apartment, and we, for her, to, she can't afford childcare, of course, because she works in the sweatshops in, 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 in the fashion district. And so we got up. She fixed us breakfast. It's 4.30 in the morning. I am dragging my little briefcase along, and I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't think we was going to get much sleep. We are waiting at one bus stop with her three children. She has to take three stops before she can even get on the bus that takes her. Because she can't afford childcare, she drops one child at a sister's and two at her mom's. And they switch off. On her day off, she takes her sister's children. There is no daycare. There is no child support infrastructure. We, we haven't fought for that. We have military complex support, but we don't, we don't have a, an infrastructure to support our children and for, and for working mothers. So it takes her three trips just to do her child care, make sure her children are safe. They were, they were all preschool. Then we get on the bus. This is a fourth stop, and of course you have to wait, and you have to time, and you have to pray that you're there before the bus is left, because otherwise you're going to have to wait another half hour. And now it's about five in the morning. From five until till, till seven, we spend getting downtown, and she has to take another shuttle to get down to Ninth Street. How many hours is that? Is that like two and a half? Is it almost three hours just to get to a sweatshop job? Just getting to her. I was so tired by the time we arrived at the clothing factory that I called my law partner, Bill Lee, and I said, come pick me up. I'm too tired to even call a cab. I had to lie down on my couch for an hour. She, meanwhile, I, mean, I, I don't know. I, she does this every day. And so when the county said they were going to cut another five bus lines, critical bus lines, so that they could take $60 million out of the bus system to plan another rail line for people like me, so that we might be able to take a train in on the weekends to go see the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion show. I said, are they high? Are they on drugs? 
There are half a million poor people who can't afford cars in L.A. I mean, that's like like being able, being able to afford water in Saudi Arabia. I mean, you know, you're, you're almost dead if you can't have a car in L.A. These are transit-dependent people to get to the hospital, to get to school, to get to a job, to get to the supermarket every day. They've got to depend on the bus. Unreliable, crowded, dirty buses. And we were gutting that system for planning for an auxiliary duplicate transit system for people who have two cars on average? I thought that they had lost their minds. And I said, you know what? Even if there are no laws, we're going to make up some laws and we're going to sue. <laughs> well, Ramona was right. Ramona Ripson is one of my best friends and she just retired from the ACLU. I do all my cases of the ACLU and mall death and NRDC. And, you know, we make up a kind of army of uh, litigators that try to do justice, environmental justice, civil justice, women's rights, uh, fighting homophobia. Well, you know, we, we, we do it together as teams because the, the, the law firms are so small. But when that journalist said that poverty was boring. I knew that we were losing the press. And I had to write a call to war. That's what this book is. This book is not based on civil rights. People don't care about civil rights. You know, civil rights lawyers belong in the Smithsonian. You know, nobody listens to what we say. Uh, right now, you say civil rights, they say Al Sharpton, and I just want to cut my wrists. But... <laughs> It is what it is. We don't know how to. We don't know how to brand ourselves. We don't know how to sell ourselves. Nobody, but you know, they they thought that when Martin Luther King got assassinated and got a holiday, that that was the end of it. When I looked at all of the tremendous success, I mean, we've won over thirty billion dollars worth of remedies and policy changes and damages through our cases alone. And then if you count the initiatives, the $20 billion that we raised to build schools, don't let the politicians tell you they did it. We did it. They told us they were too scared to do it. And we built 147 schools. All of these huge juggernaut efforts that nobody understands that we've done. I said, number one, we've got to do that. We've got to make. But number two, I have to write something that makes the case for why the upper middle class and the middle class have to care about my clients who survive in the kill zones, have to care about the cops whom we send down there to make sure they don't come into our neighborhoods. We, I had to figure out a self-interest argument because people are selfish. And if you tell them why their survival depends on getting the minimum basics in my client's neighborhood, perhaps then they'll pay attention. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you that I did it because guess who's on the back cover? Condi. Condi, Condi read this book and she said, why didn't you tell me you were doing all this? I said, well, you were kind of busy for the last eight years. She said, Y'all are incubating a transnational threat down in L.A. You just get this stuff fixed. You put my quote at the top. So, she's, so her quote, uh, she is the, the top diva in our family of divas. And believe me, we, we have quite a few of them. Um, I'm, I'm not even the worst of the bunch. Um, so, so Condi gave me my marching orders to fix our transnational threat and, and, and said that then you have to wonder why a civil rights lawyer's book is endorsed by Chief Bratton. General Stanley McChrystal and Condoleezza Rice. I believe in unlikely allies. Okay? I do nothing but unlikely allies. My first book party was at LAPD, and I sued them for 20 years. Okay? <laughs> I am brilliant at suing you and then marrying you. <laughs> I really am. Ash Chief Beck. Okay? Who said the other day, and I told him, Charlie, you really can't say this in public. I couldn't believe the words came out of his mouth. Now, I, I, wor I work with his wife, Cindy, and, I, I, Cindy and, I, so, so, and Cindy's the one you have to get permission from to have him be chief. And, um, and so when, when we, there was just, and I said, no, 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 I, Cindy and I have already talked. He said, oh, my God. But the other day he actually got up, Reverend, and he said, look, when he was defending his stance on asking for driver's licenses for illegal immigrants. I mean, who, 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 who could have imagined the chief of police of LAPD? We're, we're talking about LAPD. Daryl Gates' is LAPD. That's not what we have today. This is the story of why, in part. 
But the chief said, when somebody said, how are you taking all of the, all of the, all of the heat? He, he did two things. He said, I'm not going to confiscate trucks from immigrants if their only violation is a, is a, is a minor traffic infraction. And why, I, I told him that if you take the trucks away from these working families, you take away the livelihood of that family, and that family can die. Why are you going to confiscate the family's only way of making money when all they've got is a broken taillight? That is grotesque. So he, he, he just went out there. He says, okay, we're not going to, you know, uh, if there's no criminal background other than being here illegally, he says, it's not fair because they can't get licenses. So he saw it as a catch-22, and he said, it's stupid. I need their trust. I need them to pick up the phone and call me. So he announces this, and we're not going to impound trucks anymore. And then on top of it, he puts, he puts out this uh, uh, a driver's license policy, and I said, oh, my goodness, he's going too far. And then, and then when, he, then when he, he served Thanksgiving dinner to the Occupy L8, and then I thought, oh, my goodness, I've gone way too far. <laughs> the chief of police was, and then I, when he called me, he said, I think you're going to be proud of us. We serve Thanksgiving dinner. And I'm thinking to myself, they're vegans. They serve Thanksgiving turkeys to vegans. <laughs> But I was so thrilled, and I, th I was thinking to myself, who are you, and what have you done with Charlie Beck? You know, the crash officer I used to depose 17 years ago. So they've gone to, but you know what he said? He said to this gathering at, at the police commission, he said, I don't care what anybody else thinks. There are, since my mom died, there are only two women in my life I care. If they tell me it's the right thing to do, I'm going to do it. It's Cindy and Connie. Okay, I've deposed this man I don't know how many times, uh, lawsuits, I can't even count the lawsuits. I used to wake up every day trying to figure out how to sue LAPD in a new way. It was war. They have thrown me bodily out of, out of buildings that's in here too, you know, the, the whole saga of how we went from war to a wedding, okay? Because I needed them. I needed their power. I needed their protection for my clients. I needed the police to protect the children in the kill zones. I needed the police to think of those kids as theirs. I needed them to love, as opposed to occupy and terrorize. And that is part of the story in this book. Of the 20 years, 20 years ago we were in a riot. This, this region was traumatized by police actions that ricocheted into a riot after that verdict came down. And those of us who were here remember, it was enough to make my law partner Molly Munger leave her law firm. Now that, that, that was cataclysmic because I begged Molly not to leave her law firm. Said, no woman who made it through Harvard Law and has now got a partnership needs to leave that kind of power. I said, I don't even have a secretary. I said, if you come join me, no one will come to your New Year's party. <laughs> You're going to lose everything. All your... So this book is about the conditions that are in the pockets of what I call the kill zones. They're not the entire barrio, they're not the entire ghetto. They are tiny square block areas that can erupt in such violence that the mail can't get delivered. Animal control won't come to pick up the pit bulls that have been released. Children can't walk to school because there's a gang shooting spree. The police do last rites once a week because they're not sure that they're going to make it home. We used to have entire swaths of South LA that were like that, and East LA. It is so much better now. It is so much better now, and that's the story that's in here. How did we go from a crack war that had civil war levels of violence in our backyard that so endangered children that 17 kids at a time wouldn't go to school because they couldn't get to Jordan High School safely. And we didn't even know their trauma enough to understand that it wasn't, you can't put a nice little volunteer out there with a stop sign when their bullet's going. You have to change the dynamics in that neighborhood. And this book is about how we 
pioneered ecosystem wraparound strategies that forced the police, yes, even the military. We went and got the Navy to build the schools. And I went and got General McChrystal and General Robert Holmes. I'm a military brat. I'm sorry. I, I should have said that. I grew up in the military as an Air Force kid. I love the military. That means that's my dad. My dad can fix anything, okay? That's where I get this nothing can stop you from. I don't know, I don't know how to imagine not solving a problem. I don't care how big it is. If, 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 if it has to be removed to keep kids safe, we get it out of the way. And if it means marrying the police, I do it, okay? We went from litigating to realizing that we had the same enemy. The police were not the enemy. We had to stop them from being brutal. We had to stop the racism. We had to stop the terrorizing, of the, the, the sort of blanket pulling of African Americans over. Um, and, and, and I mean, from judges to gangsters. I have never seen a police department achieve that much uniform hatred. You have to go to South Africa to find a better job, or Northern Ireland to find a better job, of the police alienating an entire populace so thoroughly and so, so marvelously, devastatingly well. My point to them was, gentlemen, you need these folks, because what's coming down the pike if because you don't understand who's here and you don't speak the languages, you can't even talk to poor African Americans. How are you going to talk to Guatemalans? They didn't even know that Mr. Jimenez, whom they shot on 6th Street, wasn't Spanish speaking. They'd never heard of his language. I can't even pronounce it because it has too many X's in it, but it is a Mayan dialect. LAPD doesn't have the reach to create the kind of dynamic with the community that can make public safety work. They changed because they have to. They decided to go 180 degrees from paramilitary policing to community trust policing. We're not there yet. We're kind of halfway there. We've got about another 90 degrees to go. But boy, are we on the right road. When I asked, when I interviewed Beck after Bratton brought me in, see, Bratton was so smart. Like, the best service I ever did for this county was to be the human shield for Mayor Hahn to clear Bernard Parks out of the way. And as much as I admired Chief Parks, he was the wrong chief at the wrong time, and you have to be inside that police department every day to understand what's needed for that police department. And when you sue someone, you get to know them very well. When you wake up every day trying to imagine how to change their culture, you know them better than you know some of your relatives. And once they realize that I wasn't there for the money, I wasn't there for the wins, I was trying to get them to change so that I could help them do their jobs better, so the community could be safe, because why? What's the first civil right? What's a civil rights lawyer doing running around with gangsters and cops? What, you know, why have I lost my mind? No. There are no civil rights without safety. The first civil right is the right to safety, and the first freedom is freedom from violence. What do you think we're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan? That's what a civil rights lawyer is doing, running around there in gang zones and kill zones and running around with cops trying to get them to change. And when my dad read this book, he called me up and he said, Darling, thank you for not telling me what you were doing. Because if I had known you were doing this, I'd have taken Air Force One and landed in there with a platoon and taken you home, and you'd have been on restriction for the rest of your life. <laughs> My uncle said the same thing. I didn't let them know. Because I'll never forget the day when uh, Captain Hannity, who's not his, that's not his real name, there are a lot of people in here who said, kind of use my example, but just don't let it be traced back to me because then my, my, my friends will know I betrayed them. These were the good cops. I call them the Blue Angels. And they were the cops who would go to pay phones. It's LAPD. Cops, white and black, and Latino and Asian. Mainly black, but a few white angels who would go to a pay phone, for all you young people, I don't know whether you know what that is, <laughs> That's how long ago it was. And 
and they would whisper into the phone. They were so afraid of the old guard hunter-killer cops that they would go to a payphone and whisper as if LAPD might hear them. Connie, Connie, get so-and-so out of the out of the county. Graveyard's moving. Graveyard's moving. This is so-and-so LAPD. They hang up. Connie, Connie, don't come down to Grape Street tonight. Graveyard's looking for you. The good cops would get on a payphone and warn me. They would call to apologize for having to lie on the stand. Connie, I know I told you the truth in the deposition, but I've been ordered to change my testimony. So you're not going to get that from me on the stand. They would go to a payphone and warn me. And I knew that most of LAPD was made up of the good cops. It's just that the bad apples were the ones in charge of the culture. And as one cop said to me, and as, this, as, a, as I say in this book, as I tell these stories in my book, this one cop who came to me at 6 o'clock in the morning, the six-foot sergeant, she was the first woman to crash, crash, the gang, prevent, the gang uh, uh, unit. And uh, the woman had four guns, two in her back, uh, one in her ankle, and the one on her holster. I mean, the one on her holster is the biggest gun you're allowed to carry legally in, as, as a peace officer. She came to my office at six o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning one morning, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe she was in the window. And I said, Sergeant, come on in. She said, I said, well, what's the problem? She says, I'm here because you have to protect me. She had just gotten off the midnight shift, but when she was packing up her gear in some, her, southeast, her southeast division, uh, her, 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 her shift, she heard whimpering, and she opens the door, and she finds her, a fellow crash officer playing Russian roulette with a gang kid, clicking the gun in this kid's mouth. The kid had defecated on himself, had urinated, and the guy was laughing. She grabs this cop, she's bigger than he is, grabs this cop by the collar, drags him out into the hallway, bangs him up against the cinder block walls, and says, if you ever, huh, huh, do that to a kid again, I will blanking kill you. She realized what she'd done. She let him slip down to the floor. She got in her car, and she went straight to my office, and she said, they will kill me. I need your protection. Those were the good cops. She's chief at another department, by the way, but she, I had to get her out of LAPD because LAPD would have killed her. We've gone from that to getting rid of every hunter-killer cop in LAPD, save two, and they are out in Devonshire Division on a desk right now because we can't get enough proof against them, but they're not allowed on the street. Chief Parks helped do that, but then... He also destroy, helped to destroy the department, and we had to rescue it after the Rampart scandal. That was the beginning of the end of LAPD's impunity, and I went on the inside. This book is about when to stop being a warrior and then to move on the inside and to become a partner. It is also about how to think about big problems and solve them. We have done big stuff. We have solved big problems. And people don't understand how we did it. I wrote 800 pages, by the way, and they cut out 500 of them. They just wanted the police and the gang stuff, okay? So there's another 500 pages about the MTA case, about the 209 race, about how we built the schools. That story has got to be told because we actually use Navy engineers. When Roy Romer said, who are we going to get to build these schools? I said, we're going to Fort Huynimi. Come on, let's go. I know, I know some retiring Navy engineers who can get this done. And they're not going to want money. They don't operate on profit. They operate on pride. They operate on getting a job done. And that's our ethos too. This is the journey of a very uppity, privileged, very proud child of these United States. I am thrilled to be American. I'm thrilled to be the great-granddaughter of slaves and slave owners. And I'm also the great-great-granddaughter of Seminole and Cherokee Native Americans. I am 
19th century America blended, and I claim all of them, even though I could probably write my own reparations check. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a very strange existence, but what it allows me to do is it allows me to think way beyond, I'm not in any box, but way beyond any kind of box to solve problems. And that's what this story is. It is also about the debt. My privilege came at an incredible price. And I can't enjoy it fully until I know that every single child has what he or she needs to become who she or he can be. Bottom line, not on my watch are we going to declare poverty is boring. And not on my watch are children going to walk to school in fear. Any town... Any state that has money to build a bullet train has money to stop the bullets in L.A. Okay? Our priorities. Our priorities have got to get refocused. And I'm making sure that Mr. Obama gets this as well because I write, the fierce urgency of now is not just to save the middle class from the ravages of casino capitalism and jobless recoveries. It must also be to douse the flames in our basement and reach back for the forgotten. We must rekindle the hope of the hopeless, dismantle the new Jim Crow, and remove the threat posed to us all by the deadly conditions festering in the hot zones. We must invest the cost of achieving our greatest credo, e pluribus unum, or pay the price of losing the greatest democracy ever created. My quest for safety in the kill zones as the first step to realizing Martin Luther King's vision began the moment I understood that children died every day for simply wandering into the wrong neighborhood. It is a mission that has tested everything I've become to repay those who advanced freedom from fear and freedom from want on a much riskier vigil than mine. In my mind, our ancestors are watching. When the time comes to join them, I do not plan on explaining how indifference kept us from delivering the basic safety upon which freedom rests. Not on my watch. Thank you. So we're going to take some questions, and uh, then at 11, when uh, many have to disappear to go to church, uh, Connie will stay and sign books in their for sale here, not too early to buy Christmas presents. <laughs> okay, questions? Please raise your hands, and we'll get the mic to you. Over here? Yes, please. Uh, let, let us get the mic to you, okay? Uh, so it, we have people streaming uh, and watching this. I've always been a great admirer of yours. Um, I've always wondered, have you ever considered, and I'm sure you have, and there are reasons why you haven't, but I would love to see you run for office, <laughs> run for mayor. <laughs> no, no you, you know, people have asked me to do and I, I, I would be impeached. Um, the... the the real reason, and I won't raise money, I will not, we, I, I, I've said before, somebody said, I said, I don't do brothels, when they asked, when they asked me, why don't you run, and I said, I, and somebody said, that's a little strong, Connie, I said, okay, I don't do escort services. So, our pay to say, pay to play, pay to stay system is so corrupt that I couldn't operate in it. Some, if somebody gave me a million dollars, and a, most, most offices are not worth having. There's not enough power in the mayor of L.A. to do it. County supervisor, yes, but I won't raise the money. And so um, that's why. And, and, and I have found this, this, this book is about how when you don't have official power, you actually do jujitsu to transform other elected officials, local leaders, other folks' power into yours. And that, that's what I've always done. Um, I have far more clout with the police department than any of the police commissioners. They will tell you that. 
So it's not the position, it's how you work the system and analyze where the power is, and then you hijack it. That's what a lawsuit is. You are hijacking the power from one arena and placing it in another to get the right result. So um, I could do elected office, but I, it, would be, it, would be, it wouldn't be pretty, and, and I would probably end up getting impeached. Yeah. Okay. Here's the next question. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Rice, I have a very good friend who was working with SCLC uh, in 2007 and 2008. At that time, she told me that there was a gang war in Jordan Downs where five young men were killed in one day. There was not one word in any of the press outlets in Los Angeles. That is incredible. I mean, where else would five killings not make the press? Um, what can we do to make the press more aware that the kill zones deserve attention? Yes, excellent question, and I've asked that question. And, and the press say, it's not news. It's, it's too common. It's not news. They, they will report when a middle-class child gets killed. They will, report when, when they will report on a killing if it's an innocent younger child. You, you'll see those. They get, they get an article. Or if it's an elderly grandmother or somebody. There. But if it's just the normal male mayhem, no, they, they, they don't cover it. They, they, they start the homicide blog, and, and they will note it on the homicide blog, but they don't cover it. And that, that's a lot of what my book is about, is how we have allowed mass killing like this to become the norm. It's like, as Bo Taylor, one of the gang intervention guys I worked with so, so closely until he died of throat cancer about four years ago, as Bo said, our deaths are like wallpaper on your dining rooms. You don't even notice it. And um, that, that's a very important dynamic. Um, we can make sure that everybody knows, and, and we've got social media now that I don't know how to do because I'm asocial, but there are ways, there are ways to make sure that that's, that's known, that, that we don't just let these children die in obscurity. You know it's bad when the funeral directors come to my office and say, Connie, please, please do something. We don't want to bury any more children. They're making money off of this stuff and don't want the money. Um, it, now, now it is much better now. The the the, the great, the uplifting thing about it, it, it is a page turner, and and I have been told that people can't go to sleep after they read it, so you have to read it during the day. But people, you know, I, I, the, the, it, it has gotten a whole lot better. I mean, pe the grandmothers no longer put their kids to bed in the bathtub. That's how bad the crack wars were. But let me tell you where it is getting that bad, in rural. Antelope Valley, where the crank economy is mirroring the violence of the crack economy 20 years ago. So poor white children are now undergoing the exact same trauma that poor black and Latino children are now are going to. So, and, and, and you can't see them because they're tucked away in the rural folds of the countryside. And you have to have a very different strategy to help those children. Those children are being buried alive now. And so forcing the county, and I have moved into the county, and Bill Fujioka and, and Mark Lee Thomas and Zev and all that, the county is terrifying because the county is so much bigger than the city. I spent 20 years getting LAPD on the right road that I ignored the county, and the county is where the children die. That's $24 billion of our money. You need to have a county watch program to understand these bureaucracies. Now, there are good people in these bureaucracies. I don't have the energy. Litigation is for young people. I'm no longer young. I'm going on 60 now. So that's for younger people. I can't drag the county into court the way I did. I won three cases against them. But probation, child services, foster care. We need to pull all of the organizations that run together on that and then help those agencies change. I'm doing the infiltration mode. I'm going to do the seduction thing rather than the war thing. Okay, because we have enough friends inside. It's just that they don't know how to change. Keep this in mind. LAPD, I was suing the, the heck out of them and getting all kinds of consent. They didn't know how to change themselves. They needed our help. It's kind of like husbands need their wives help to figure out what's going on in their own minds. You know, I mean, my mom does that with my dad all the time. I hate to bring gender in here, but I am a feminist. And it, 
and, I, and a female chauvinist, I have to tell you. It's not whether you have biases, it's knowing which biases you have and then counteracting them. I do have to be very careful. I have to go through therapy sometimes. But bottom line is the county, we have got to get the county infrastructure right. There's $24 billion for 24, you give me $24 billion, I'll solve the whole country's problems. We can get this done, but we're gonna have to organize ourselves to go into these bureaucracies. On the outside, we need a culture revolution because there's no reason you can't shut down a mass incarceration strategy by making sure they can't arrest anybody. That's what Harry Belafonte said, organize yourselves. You give them your bodies and your criminal stupidity and that's why they can fill these jails up. Change the culture so that the male warrior needs, power needs, get concentrated on saying, ni un niño mas, not another kid, not another man. You don't get our bodies to fill your cages. So we need a cultural revolution, we need the systemic change, and they've all gotta be done at the same time. It's not one or the other. It's not about size of government. It's about the effectiveness. So, I forget what question I was answering, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my question at this moment is uh, particularly, how do we change the middle class and their thinking? In other words, in the short run, they got to pay more taxes. Yes, Everybody's got So vote for Molly Munger's initiative, and we will all be paying more taxes across the board, and we will, it'll actually go to the schools. But, but, but just very quickly, because we've got to get up to, we've got to, get up to hear the sermon. Um, the, I make the argument that the military, not civil rights lawyers, not feminists, not environmentalists, not any of the leftists they love to, they love to just disparage and immediately dismiss, I make the argument in terms of military warnings and Bill Bratton's warnings. I brought General McChrystal out here to assess our gang situation. I brought General Holmes out here to assess our gang situation. We had the Archimedes group who was doing Afghanistan. I brought them out here and each one of them done. And then Commander Gann, whom I write about here, is not his name, top, he's Petraeus's brain on counterinsurgency. He spent four days out here with Bill Bratton and Sheriff Baca and then canceled the fourth day and said, I need to spend it with Connie. And he brought me up to the patio at that hotel. And the, it used to be the Continental. They changed the hotels, changed their names every five minutes. I can't remember what they are. We're sitting out there on the patio because he's a chain smoker. The guy is brilliant. I haven't had a conversation like that since I left Harvard. I, I just love it. I say, do you have to go? I just wanted to keep talking to the guy. He said, let me tell you what you have. He said, sit down, take out that notebook, and shut up, Connie. Don't say a thing. I'm tired of hearing you talk. T sit down and shut up and take notes. He said, and of course, I'm a military kid, and it's like my dad telling me as so I get the notebook. He said, let me tell you what you have out here. He said, I've been fighting insurgencies around the world to keep this country safe. I've been fighting them for 40 years. And I come out here and find out that the same crap is in my backyard? He said, I'm livid with you people. Sounded like Condoleezza. You're, you're nesting a transnational threat. Fix this. So Commander Gann looks at me and says, you have what we call a sustained, incipient, parasitic insurgency. And it is full-blown. That's the good news. The bad news is that you have brilliant cops who are applying elegant tactical solutions to a sustained strategic threat, and it cannot work. That's the bad news. So my job is to get the police to understand that they can't do whack-a-mole and hook em book em and counter an insurgency. The second thing is to get out to the middle class why they have to care about an insurgency in their own backyard and what it does to seed areas that are so lawless that the cartels move in. The cartels have been operating in LA County for at least 15 years. They are now reaching a phase where they're owning properties, very much like how Italy incorporated its own organized crime. We don't wanna go down the road to Palermo. We wanna go down the road to Stockholm. But right now we're at the fork in the road and these military experts are telling the middle class, don't take the road to Palermo. That's what this book, so how does the middle class get scared enough? Maybe they'll listen to the military. They're not gonna listen to me. 
But I've told the story of how we linked up with the military to get the real picture. Maybe a frame that has Condi saying, this is real. If you've got Condoleezza Rice and Connie Rice saying the same thing, there's got to be something there, right? Thank you.